then continued with the, and, and the electron microscopes and continued with the optical microscopes with atomic resolution, molecular resolution, they have really opened our eyes to understand at the nanoscale what happens in life. So medicine of the year 2000 looked somewhat like that. That's what I learned in medical school. We have bodies, we have cells, we have atoms, we have molecules and chromosomes, and there was a gap in the middle. The gap, which was at the subcellular scale. So we looked at the cell as a kind of bag with some soup in it. But now we have understood that the nanoscale organization at the subcellular level is the key that we need to understand to improve medicine. And the, uh, we are closing now this gap in medical knowledge by imaging, by understanding, by tools and by materials. Another revolution in uh, nanoscience, which had got the Nobel Prize recently, are the quantum dots, semiconductor nano-objects, which have led to this colored revolution of uh, science in the nanoscale. We have the semiconductor nanodots. We have the gold nanoparticles, which in the meantime have evolved into the most widespread medical test technology based on the lateral flow tests that exploit the properties of nanoparticles. And then we have also the nanoparticles where specific shapes influence their effects through quantum effects. Now, coronavirus, we have experienced that, has been shown to be the most deadly biological nanoparticle in a century. Estimates are that this virus killed about 18 million people, so approximately the same number as we believe that were killed by the influenza pandemic 100 years ago. Uh, but at the same time, we have seen that nanostructured vaccine are probably a century's most life-saving drug class. The estimates are that the, nano, uh, the coronavirus vaccines have saved about 18 million or 20 million people in the first year of their application. And what you see on the left side of the slide is a kind of uh, ranking of which vaccine has saved most people in the first year. And from that information, we have learned that a key to a globally life-saving vaccine is, is it efficient against death and severe disease, also against transmission to stop a pandemic. But also it's important to understand that speed of development and production was key in this evolution. And then the broad availability to a high-risk population and here, the two similar vaccines from, the, uh, from Pfizer and from Moderna showed some difference in distribution, possibly just to the, the problem of producing higher doses of RNA and deploying the, uh, the uh, vaccine to the high-risk population in the first year. Then we have the challenge of global availability, stability, transport, pricing. We need to understand, or we are increasingly understanding the side effect potential of such drugs. And then we have also learned that the, the perception by the target population to be vaccinated is fundamental for a societal impact of uh, such a vaccine. Let's look at the shape of these successful COVID-19 vaccines. We have the virus nanoparticle in the Oxford drug. We, a vaccine. we have the lipid nanoparticle in the Moderna and the Pfizer drug. We have the protein nanoparticle with a nanoparticle adjuvant in the Novavax vaccine. So it's amazing that so different vaccines turn up to be so similar in the use of nano as a structural feature. And I think that shows us that the, for the immune system, nano size is a very specific thing that uh, has a, a importance. The immune system is built to defend against viruses, against nano objects, and we can also exploit these nano object properties to be effective against viruses. And the last Nobel Prize 
uh, I would like to show is the Nobel Prize for the development of modified RNA, which enabled their use as therapeutics. Unmodified RNA is detected as a foreign object, and the body knows how to defend itself against such foreign objects. But if we uh, modify RNA uh, nucleosides, then this becomes a druggable substance. Now do we have found the perfect carriers for RNA, for therapeutics? Uh, I'm not so sure yet, because when we look at what happens to an, a lipid nanoparticle drug, is we see that it goes to the injection site, which is clear. Some of it go to the lymphatic organs, which is good, but a lot of it goes to the circulation, and through the circulation it goes everywhere and it goes to every organ, also to the heart. And this may be one of the key mechanisms when we have a lipid nanoparticle that leads to protein expression in a target organ. If we, target, if we if it reaches the heart, the cardiomyocytes may be able to express uh, uh, spike protein and then the cardiomyocyte is recognized by the immune defense as a uh, an invader. And this may be an, an, uh, a mechanism leading to the myocarditis, which we see in, our, in this, our patient, for example, where we have a widespread uh, heart muscle problem. This patient needed mechanical circulatory support, and he died nevertheless in the end. It's very rare, but it's relevant, and it's probably under, it's understandable, I believe, and it might be avoidable if we learn how to better target these vaccines to where they belong to the immune system. Now, have we found nano systems to deliver other drugs in a perfect way? To deliver perfect uh, uh, other drugs, we need to consider the, uh, the question of where are they delivered? Are they delivered intracellularly? RNA needs to be delivered intracellularly or is sufficient to deliver them extracellularly? Then the question is, if you package something into a lipid container, where does it, when and where does it leave this con container? And here we have learned from uh, the Bahnholz group that the tumor environment interestingly produces ammonia, which facilitates release of doxorubicin from doxil, and this may be one of the reasons why doxyl is so successful and why packaging other drugs into liposomes have not been so successful in cancer up to now. Now I have to accelerate my presentation a little bit to a kind of record the time. What we see on the left upper panel is we have cellular targets in the arteriosclerotic block of mice fed with high cholesterol diets who have a transgenic background. On the lower end, you see that we have produced nanocarriers that are polymeric, that are pack-free but stealthy, that uh, are releasing drug upon arrival at the target, that are well characterized, that are non-toxic, and that are scalable. And these nanoparticles are able to reach the target cells in the arteriosclerotic block. And if you look at the proof of a, a therapeutic effect in vivo chronic mouse experiments on the right side, we see the first histo panel shows the arteriosclerosis in a placebo-treated mouse. The second shows the arteriosclerosis in a statin, oral statin-treated mouse. The third one shows the arteriosclerosis degree in one of our active targeting treated mice, uh, and this preliminary findings show you that we seem to be on the right track towards effective therapy of arteriosclerosis. We seem to be much better than oral statins, the current standard. There is still a lot of work ahead because the way from academic proof of concept to a drug applied in a, in a patient is a, is a long way, but we hope to, to end up there at some point. Now, towards the future paradigm of eradication of arteriosclerosis means we need to 
eliminate the plaques before they ever become symptomatic. This might avoid most strokes, heart attacks, heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, vascular dementia. Uh, the global cost of arteriosclerosis is about one trillion dollars per year, and there is a lot that might be saved, kind of helping our cost crisis in medicine. And if we achieve such an eradication of arteriosclerosis in the presymptomatic stage, this will change medicine forever. Now, at the same time, we are looking into the African context, Congo, uh, poverty disease, schistosomiasis, where we did the uh, Clinum schistosomiasis trial, the largest trial up to now in schistosomiasis. You see on the left side the standard diagnostics, which is stool microscopy, very tedious, uh, costs you an hour, but because salaries are so, are so low, it costs only $5 to do it. Uh, specificity and sensitivity are not so good. And on the right side, you see a gold nanoparticle-based test, which costs $10, which is more than the capital spent for health in this country in a year. Uh, and what we have seen that is using these nanoparticle-based lateral flow assays massively improves diagnostics, but it also shows us the threat that there really is. So the government of Congo believed that the rate of chrysosomiasis in this area is about 15%, and we showed that it's about 70%. So everybody has it, essentially. It is associated with higher morbidity than was believed up to now. Uh, and the conclusions of this clinum chrysosomias trial is this is the first coherent and complete epidemiologic insight into schistosomiasis in eastern Congo since the colonial times. It shows a high, uh, it shows improved diagnosis by nano-based diagnostics. It shows, shows a high prevalence even where it was before. It was not present before the wars. It shows that the wealth of Congo in minerals, which is huge, has no impact on the health, on the health of the population. And it also showed that public health care does not reach the population at need. So if you are interested in developing, develop tests for poverty disease. They may help a lot. There is big hope in artificial intelligence of promoting medicine. Uh, I won't go into that. Just one slide. Beware of hallucinations of artificial intelligence. So if you enter two lovers, into uh, mystic AI, so one of the test sites for artificial intelligence, you may get such pictures, and if you look at them, you see that AI may uh, deliver impressive results, but they are not so detailed on the anatomical result. Now, if you project that, if you project that in medical diagnostics, that makes it very difficult. Here it's easy to see that the fingers are not so really coherent, but if you have a medical diagnostic list with a list of diagnoses, you won't recognize the hallucination in the data you get. And there, this needs a lot of uh, work to be to improved. So to summarize, nanomedicine has evolved from science fiction to a pillar of today's medicine. It has comp contributed largely to overcoming the recent pandemic by sa saving millions of people. As nano aspects are pervasive across all disease categories and are rapidly gaining ground in diagnostics and therapy, nanomedicine is no longer a specialty, but rather a basic knowledge to be incorporated everywhere. The potential of nanomedicine for healthcare has by far not been exhausted. Paradigm shifts for prevalent diseases enabled by nanomedicine are at the horizon. And I would like to conclude with the same slide I showed in the beginning, reminding us that mankind needs to improve a lot, not only technology. Thank you.